Will everyone eventually ride in the lap of luxury? Well, we know one company that hopes so, and that's this week on Motoring 2000. TSN's Motoring 2000 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. The city of Wiesbaden, Germany, and like so many towns and villages in Europe, it dates back centuries and is steeped in history. And speaking of history, we're here to check out Mercedes-Benz third generation C-Class. And like its competitors, with prices ranging from thirty-five dollars to $50,000, these cars give a whole new meaning to the term entry level. But as I say, this car has a long history with Mercedes. And as we're about to see, the company is convinced this car will live up to its new model that suddenly everything is different. The new 190 class. The technology, the quality, the functional excellence synonymous with Mercedes-Benz presented in a new kind of automobile. The result of well, back in the early 80s, I think Mercedes-Benz realized they were missing out on a huge segment of the market and decided to chase the BMW 3 Series amongst others. And they ended up with the 190, a car that was generally not very well conceived in my opinion. It just wasn't up to the standards of the rest of the Mercedes-Benz lineup. The 190 class is a trim and nimble machine, as exciting to drive as any sports sedan ever designed, yet too versatile, too practical to be a sports sedan. Since that point in time, they've improved each of the models uh, to the point now where they have a very viable product. Engine and transmission combining to generate... That's when they decided to go into that segment in the early 80s, 83, 84. It was just simply a matter of increasing sales volume going into a segment where there are a lot more sales available, a lot more customers, and increasing the lineup. In Canada, it's a fairly important segment of the marketplace because it goes up some, against some very tough competitors. The 3 Series BMW is the most obvious, but you've also got people like Audi with the A4, Acura with the TL, Infiniti, Lexus, there's a whole bunch of them. It's in a very tough segment, so they've had to improve it, and I think that's to the benefit of the consumer. I think the, the, the new C-Class, or even the current one, are yeah, uh, a big step from the 190. The 190 was a small car, an entry-level car, uh, to open the Mercedes-Benz family up for the customers, uh, to have an opportunity, maybe with a less expensive car, uh, to join the family and then to move on to the other models. But today, I think the C-Class is a, is a full-fledged addition of our model line. and uh, It's a car you enter, and you can keep driving that car for a long time. Given motoring conditions in America, you might expect their car of the year to be something like this. And in spirit, it is. The car is uh, very different compared to the old one, and I think we're going to attract some European uh, customers from our competitors. But I, I also think, and uh, I think that's going to be the majority that we're going to attract maybe customers who are today driving a domestic, driving maybe a Japanese border, and who want to move on to a European car, and there is the C-Class, I think, is a great alternative. Bearing a striking resemblance to the company's top-of-the-line S-Class, some journalists were prompted to describe the new car as a small S-Class. I would actually use it's a big, a big C-Class. 
That's what I would use. It's not a small S class. I mean, naturally, we always did that. When we bring a new model, there are some lines in it from the model which was just introduced. And the S class yeah, was introduced last year and it opened up the new family. And you have the lines in the C class now. You will see these lines in the successor models of the E class, and maybe in some of the niche products too, like the CLK or the SLK when they come in a few years. I think it's a, it's a independent car. It uh, looks a little bit like it, like an S-Class from the side, but when you look at the front, it's very different. The rear is different. I think the whole appearance of the car is a different. Way. They told us yesterday, no, it's not a small S-Class, and, and I'm tempted to say, yeah, right. No, it's got so many of these. Uh, it's not a bad thing. The old trickle-down effect has done, has, has done wonders for Lexus, for example. It's, it's done wonders for, for all Toyotas when you think about it. And it's been the same at Infinity and, and, and with Acura, for example. So the S-Class, there was a definite influence. And my driving partner was saying, how do we uh, move the headrest? Well, just like the S-Class. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know, the button, you just use the button. You don't have to use the manual. Little things like that add up. So I think there's a lot of value that's been, uh, that's been uh, packaged or, or, or brought into this class from the higher, from the E-Class and the S-Class. I mean, I think trickling down in that sense is, it's, uh, it's very good. If you look at the market today, the luxury market in Canada is not a huge market. But it is the biggest, the biggest part of that market is actually located in a segment below $55,000. And that's where we're going to be with the sequence. So we have to be there. Well, that's the latest Mercedes-Benz. I wonder how the old ones stack up against their domestic and Japanese competitors. That's coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. Leather covered seats, the front ones being heated and the driver getting eight way power adjustment. You almost, 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 almost. Sorry, I'm almost getting it right. Even the gear shift knob and leather st and steering wheel, Alan Leather steering wheel. God, this is going to be a long day, man. You know, about a decade ago, the thought of a luxurious Hyundai would have been almost laughable. But it's time to forget all about the old Stella and look forward. This week, we slip behind the wheel of the all-new Hyundai Sonata, the latest entrant in the midsize category. The Sonata is offered in both four- and six-cylinder derivatives. While the four is up to hauling the car around reasonably well, it's the V6 that's going to be the motivator of choice. This 2.5-litre 24-valve twin cam pumps out a respectable 170 ponies and 166 pounds-feet of torque at 4 grand. It is also surprisingly quiet at all but the highest end of the rev range. Matting the loud pedal produces a 0 to 100 km per hour sprint in just under 10 seconds, and at 6.5 seconds the 80 to 120 passing move is spirited. To rein in the horses, Sonata uses traction control. You know, luxury is a function of two things, amenities and presentation. When it comes to the amenities, this Sonata comes quite literally loaded. You've got power everything, leather seats that include heaters and eight-way adjustment for the driver, automatic climate controls and a very good radio. You even get a leather-wrapped gear knob and steering wheel. However, when it comes to presentation, the Sonata is lacking and it's primarily down to this very gaudy wood trim. Not only is it bad enough to give fake wood a bad name, it might even make the odd environmentalist wish for real wood. The only box available is a four-speed automatic that learns your driving habits. Drive enthusiastically and the transmission spreads the shifts out to promote performance. Tread gingerly however and it upshifts quickly to improve fuel economy. Generally speaking the shifts are smooth and when needed the kickdown is prompt. The lone complaint with the automatic transmission is the fact that there's virtually no detent between drive and third. As a result, it's all too easy to pull it back down into third. Now out on the highway, that would absolutely cripple the fuel economy. The Sonata GLS combines a stiff chassis with a supple coil spring suspension. The front end uses a pair of wishbones, the rear a multi-link design. There are also roll bars at both ends. 
During the pylon test, the Sonata tracked a true line with modest body roll and minimal understeer. Adding to the surprisingly decent dynamics is a variable rate rack and pinion steering setup that delivers both good feedback and a positive on-centre feel. You know, when it comes to interior space, this Sonata is very generous. You've got plenty of head and leg room, the trunk will carry 374 litres of your junk, and the rear seat, well, it splits 70-30 to allow you to carry longer items. All in all, the Sonata is a very accommodating car. The four-wheel disc brakes with four-channel ABS haul the Sonata to rest repeatedly without fuss or fade. Again, a surprisingly good performance. For the record, the stops measured just 109 feet from 80k. This Sonata is a legitimate contender in the mid-size family sedan category. It brings V6 power, a loaded agenda and decent dynamics. In short, if you're looking for a family sedan, this car should be on your list. If you can get past the wood, that is. Well, this is a very old trend. Uh, you can thank our Mexican friends and the guys down in South LA. It's uh, something that's been going on since the 50s and has been quiet, but with today's new products and, and, and new skills available in shops around the world, uh, it's come back and it's very, very affordable. Usually in the two and a half to $5,000 range, we'll definitely get you a vehicle that'll dance up and down, side to side, back to front, or three wheel motion. And it's just for looks? It's just for looks, it's just for fun. It has nothing to do with anything else. It's either, it's me, and that's the end of the story. I've been dying to ask this question. Why do you do this? It's theft proof, it's different, and nobody can tow my truck when I'm downtown. You can put it flat down? Oh yeah. And it's different. Oh yeah, it's definitely different. Definitely a crowd uh, pleaser, and everybody loves it. You never do it while driving, though? Never. Can't do it. There's a switch that locks it out. And you never do it after a heavy meal? I wouldn't try it. This week's Midas tip was suggested by Neil, our co-op student at the shop. He suggested I talk about fuel economy tips, and in light of the price of gasoline these days, I think it's important that you know some of these things. For example, tire pressures. If you keep your tires properly inflated, you can save a lot of fuel. Underinflated tires have increased rolling resistance, and you have to use more throttle to propel the vehicle. Keeping your engine tuned and a clean air filter can go a long way to saving fuel. Also, unloading excess weight from the trunk or from your roof racks can also increase the fuel economy of your vehicle. Other things that are important too are driving smart and buying smart. When I say driving smart, I mean avoid excessive speed when you're cruising on the highway. Don't leave your engine idling because that's zero miles per gallon and a lot of people in the winter time leave the thing idling to keep it warm and in the summer idling to keep the air conditioner going. Doesn't make any sense to waste fuel like that. Also when I say buying smart, don't buy any more or heavier vehicle or bigger engine than you need to do the job. A lot of people are stuck today with some heavyweight vehicles with huge engines they wish they'd never seen. Even buying smart in terms of tires can save a lot too. Skinny high pressure tires have lower rolling resistance than those cool low wide tires that a lot of people bought. If you keep your vehicle in tune, buy the right tires and buy the right vehicle when you're changing vehicles, it'll go a lot towards saving fuel. That's your Midas tip of the week. It is a 1964 Corvair Monza 110, brown interior, saddle interior, convertible. I picked it up in approximately 15 years ago, and it taken me approximately 11 years to disassemble and reassemble. And the last year was the first year I had it on the road. The Corvair delivers the goods as no other compact car can. The spare tire is covering the carburetor. It's dual single throat carburetors. As you can see, this spare tire covers one. And that rubber never gets that hot? or No, air-cooled engine never gets that hot. As an owner, as a driver, the engine in the back, the spare tire, what do you think of it? Was it really a problem? No problems all the time that I've had it, but I haven't put that many miles on it, and I love driving it. It's usually a Sunday driver. If General Motors wishes to know, why I spent an inordinate amount of time on the Corvair. 
It is because the Corvair is an inordinately dangerous vehicle. Ralph Nader said it was unsafe at any speed. What do you think of that? Well, I put a few miles on it and I haven't had any problems. <laughs> I don't know if Ralph has or not. <laughs> We're back in a Mercedes C320, and we're on the Autobahn in Germany. And if you love to drive and have never had an opportunity to drive the Autobahn, believe me, you got to do it at least once in your life. I mean, I'm approaching 200 kilometers an hour, everybody driving in their proper lane, indicating lane changes. It's so civilized and a lot of fun. This is the way these cars were made to be driven. All right, let's head to the garage and join Bill Gardner. Bill? Well, folks, I strongly suggest if you ever look in your rearview mirror and you see Brad Diamond coming up on you, I'd get out of there, whether it's 200 kilometers an hour or not. You ever noticed uh, when you look at Brad with his mustache and sunglasses on, he looks a lot like Dale Earnhardt, doesn't he? Drives like him, too. You don't want to swap paint with this guy, so just uh, back out of there. Anyhow, I want to talk about scan tools this week and how mechanics use them to better repair your car. Now, scan tools can typically be used on most cars from the middle 80s and newer. Some of those cars had what we called computer-controlled carburetors, and of course, after about 1987 or 88, almost all of them had computerized or computer-controlled fuel injection. This 89 Olds is a perfect example. Now, in behind the dash on the passenger side of this vehicle is the computer that runs the engine. It decides how much fuel to inject and when, what the spark timing should be, what all the emission control devices should do and when they should operate and to what degree. It, and it receives data from a number of sensors on the engine to base its uh, fuel calculations and spark timing calculations, etc. And the input from those sensors is very important. Then it commands certain things to operate so that it can run the engine. Now, if you want to figure out if any of those sensors are bad, you're going to need a scan tool to do it. That's what mechanics use to analyze them. It's a really handy tool. Now, if I start the engine up, the data will start coming through to the scan tool. The scan tool is plugged in underneath the left side of the dash here to the ALDL, which is short form for assembly line data link. It's also plugged into the cigarette lighter to get power to power it up. You can get quite a bit of information on the screen here. We can see the integrator number and block learn. Those are the fuel trim numbers. We can see the engine's running at 195 degrees uh, Fahrenheit coolant temperature. For example, the throttle position sensor, we've got a value of 0.40 of a volt right now. That's because we're at idle. If I turn the key off, turn the key back on, and floor the throttle, you'll see the throttle position sensor uh, value changing as I move my foot on the throttle. That's exactly as it should be. At idle, it's approximately 0.40 of a volt, and wide open throttle on this car, 4.11 volts. Also, we can analyze the sensors. We can figure out what for example, the oxygen sensor is doing. It's a very important input to the computer, and it allows the uh, computer to fine-tune the engine, the engine's uh, air-fuel mixture, as you drive. And uh, there's a number of other sensors as well on the engine. For example, in this one, we've got a coolant temp sensor, throttle position sensor, mass airflow sensor, and all these sensors are valuable information to the computer. If any one of them is wrong or out of spec or stuck, for example, or open circuit, any problem with it, it's going to affect the way the car drives. It's going to dramatically, in many cases, affect the fuel economy and the power of the vehicle. A lot of mechanics use these tools for uh, diagnosing problems, and it's a really, really good tool for figuring out quickly which sensors are bad, which ones you have to replace. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2000. It's impossible. To keep the ocean from the shore, it's just impossible. Ask a baby not to cry, it's just impossible. For to live without you now, it's just impossible. <laughs>
Now there's no Acura, Lexus or Infiniti numbers in here because those cars weren't sold 11 to 15 years ago. If we had more recent data, they'd be on top, right? Well, no. The six to 10 year scores that DeRossier has calculated show Lincoln is the number one brand. Cadillac again is number two. Toyota, well, they're tied with Oldsmobile. You could win some bar bets with that. Acura and Honda are dead even, so it makes you wonder why anybody would spend extra for the Acura brand. Lexus is only two percentage points above the industry average, and Infiniti's actually below it. Now, you'd expect the used car market would reward the domestic longevity with higher resale value, right? Well, no. DeRossier calculates percentage of original value retained after five years. The top five brands, they're all Japanese, headed by Acura. Now, as DeRossier himself puts it, do Japanese cars last longer? No. Are they easier and cheaper to repair? No. Do they retain their value better? Yes. Go figure. Now, the dead last car on the resale chart, it's Cadillac. Here they are, both short and long terms, building some of the toughest, most durable cars in the world, and that's the thanks they get. Well, nobody said life was fair. Now, the upshot of all this is, if you're looking for a great used car value, buy your granddad's caddy. It'll cost you dirt, and it'll probably live longer than you will. Because as the funeral directors always say, sooner or later, you're going to ride in a Cadillac. I'm Jim Kent. The route to your intermediate destination is being calculated. Follow the roads until further instructions. Well, you know, the new C-Class, like many cars at this level, comes equipped with a navigational system, something I've never liked. They're complicated, the and they force you to take your eyes off the road. Well, I've got to admit, we find ourselves in the middle of nowhere in the German countryside, having to get to the airport in the quickest time possible. Well, it was simply a matter of programming the system, and then with two hands on the wheel and eyes on the road, we were led directly to our destination. You have reached your destination. So who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Well, that's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. It was never a mistake. It was a, it was a great car. The, uh, the only thing was is that Pontiac had to sell the vehicle initially as, uh, as a commuter car to be able to get it through because the other two-seater uh, belonged to Corvette. They couldn't sell it as a sports car to the corporation, so they sold it as a commuter car. TSN's Motoring 2000 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.